15th of January 2000. Is anyone else in the room giving presentation? And 11. Wikipedia the. F <laughs> Wikipedia helps people all over the world. When we received Hebrew Wikipedia's 10th anniversary brief, we thought it was about time that media people who use Wikipedia regularly should return the favor. Oh, <laughs> 
So hi everyone, um, I'm Tom, I'm the uh, session host. This session is on Wikimedia 3 uh, and cooperation. Uh, so we've got three speakers, Zico, who's going to be talking about cooperation between chapters, and then Itzik, who will be talking about the role of media uh, in the development of Wikipedia, and then John, uh, who's going to be talking about what um, a scientific Wikipedian in residence does. Uh, John is at the Royal Society at the moment. So, first of all, uh, Zico, I'll hand over to you. Hello, Wikimaniacs. Um, honestly, uh, this will be a talk about the short history of the Wikimedia Chapters Association. Uh, when I wrote this submission, I considered how should I make the text so it could be approved. 
So uh, cooperation between the chapters, well, I'm afraid you will not hear a lot about cooperation between the chapters in this speech, but uh, we will see. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, talk something about my sociological background. I read two Wikipedia articles that helped me better to understand um, what, we have, what happened in reality. I'm not sure whether you have already heard of the Parkinson's Law. There was once a committee in the US where the committee members talked a lot about a bike shed and about coffee for another committee. Uh, many, many hours for something that was about small money. The same committee also decided on a nuclear power plant costing many, many millions of dollars and they discussed about it for less than five minutes. Uh, obviously because politicians know not so much about nuclear power plants, but they know a lot about drinking coffee. And this is not just bashing politicians, it is with everyone, of course. So Parkinson's law says um, people might discuss long, not about the things that are important, but about the things they would like to talk about. The other sociological law is the Dunning-Kruger thesis. Um, I, I have tried to dump it down for myself so that I would understand. You can read the Wikipedia article. It means um, stupid people don't understand that they are stupid. You know, it means that um, people uh, lack the skills they would have necessary in, under, in order to understand that they are stupid. So if they would have those skills to understand that, they wouldn't be stupid anymore. You know, so, um, no, you can read the Wikipedia article. Uh, who am I? Oh yes, uh, this is what I wanted to say in advance. Uh, I don't want to use curse words. I have agreed with myself, I will use the word stupid. And I hope no other words, maybe one of you want to count uh, the number of times of stupid. And I won't talk much about personal names, proper names. Is there still a question or do you have Wi-Fi problems? No? Um, uh, I will talk about some persons in a positive way, I think, and uh, well, about many other names I won't talk, but yes, funnily, in our movement, most things are public anyway. Have a look at MetaWiki. So who am I? My way to the wiki media movement was editing Wikipedia. There are other ways. This was mine. I was the chair of the Dutch chapter Wikimedia Nederland for three years, in the period we will talk about. I'm a volunteer for the German chapter and now I'm also busy with the wiki team, which is a network of people who are presenting Wikipedia to schools or universities and other institutions. A short introduction about the Dutch chapter. I think the Dutch chapter was for me a good preparation to understand better the, uh, the international level. We saw in the Dutch chapter, and you see it on many, many chapter boards, that not everyone who is on such a board... Oh, is, is, it really, is there a problem? Uh, maybe Tom can help you? No? It's okay? There were many, uh, or some board members, who were capable in many, many aspects of their life, but not on the board, for one simple reason. They just didn't like board work. You know, the thought that going on a board is like chatting about categorizing Wikipedia articles or just socialize. But no, being on a board means it's similar to running a business. You must read the figures, make budgets, plans, uh, report. And many people just don't like to do that as a hobby. And uh, well, if you have too many of those people on a board, you can understand why there's a problem. Luckily, over time, and in uh, 2012, uh, Franz Reisenhout, who is just now entering the room, uh, he became board member, and uh, that was really, really great. He does not have a Wikipedia background. And uh, slowly, we understood that if we want to have employees and work seriously and achieve our goals, we must transform our kind of working, our organization, to a more formal organization. 
And there were some older members who didn't like that. Uh, one former board member behaved as if he had a veto right for everything we were doing, and he came to the general assemblies with long list of complaints, what we were doing wrong. But indeed, Wikimedia Nederland now is a healthy, sustainably growing organization that actually gets things done to the dismay of some people and to the happiness of many, many other people. Oh, this would have been the slide for that. Okay, the international level. You may uh, remember there has been in Haifa a Wikimania in August 2011. Do we have some? Uh, here are some places. Yeah, the, the German won't bite. Oh, sorry, friendly spaces policy. Uh, I'm German too. Um, yeah, uh, is there something to discuss there? We could do it later. There will be times for questions. Uh, the Haifa letter, it means simply that the Wikimedia Foundation thought that the chapters, the national organizations in the Wikimedia movement should not do the fundraiser again. I won't argue about the right terminology. Uh, the foundation thought it would be better if that were done, collecting the donations should be done centrally. This was communicated to the chapters in one single email, the Haifa letter, and you can imagine after several years of doing so, this, this fundraising, um, this was not accepted very well by the chapters. So that the chapters thought we need, we need a kind of cooperation to organize ourselves internationally as chapters and working better on our interests and defending our interests against the foundation. There was earlier, uh, sorry, there was later in February 2012, a Paris summit Hello? Is there a problem? Can I help you? You're there. Yes, yeah, you. Sorry, can you keep your voices down at the back, please, because it's traveling. Um, do, you, do you need assistance in something? Then speak up. Is everything done? Is that right? Sorry. I think uh, Wi-Fi problems, as usually. Uh, the Paris summit, it was a financial meeting of some board members in Paris, and uh, there again, you have this atmosphere, we chapters, we must work together somehow against the foundation. Well, I myself never found that the most important thing of cooperation between the chapters would be to be against someone or something. The most important thing is we can help each other. There are so many chapters who just need help in their evolution. And maybe if you work together, you can make structures that would be helpful, that you have someone uh, who is an expert in chapters and can visit those chapters and uh, help them in their evolution. Or sometimes we do projects internationally. Well, maybe a better cooperation of the chapters could support that. Like, uh, where will we have the next Wiki uh, Wikimania or Wikipedia, Wikimedia conference? You know, there was always this question, where should it be? And not to be decided on the last moment. Okay, we wanted a federation of chapters and for any organization, you need a kind of charter where we have explanations you know, how to do things. The discussion about that took place in February, April, I guess. I was the leading or the, the driving factor because there was no one else to do. Uh, Sebastian Moleski from Germany took a great part in that. Uh, it, was, it was great. We had some different opinions, but, well, I gave them, him the space. And we made a draft charter that was uh, not too long and also flexible, as it turned out. There were many, many people who always shouted that there should be an organization of the chapters, but they did not take much part in those discussions. For the Wikimedia Chapters Association, which we wanted to start, or to start with it, at the Wikimedia Conference, where chapters and foundation people come together in Berlin, 2012. And uh, what was the next slide? Oh, yeah, this is, this is a, a summary of the history of this association we established. And uh, you have the slides online, so it's basic, basically the periodization is by the meetings or places where we met. In Berlin, Washington was Wikimania, London was a small meeting, and Hong Kong was another Wikimania. 
and between that you had certain periods where different people were in charge. A steering committee, we will talk about that. The chair of the council later was Ashley van Heften, uh, user fair from Britain, and later Markus Glaser, the council member from Germany. Now I must see the next slide, or oh, that's Berlin, Berlin, yes. Okay, we had charter discussions, we had a draft charter, we were ready to go. The chapter, the chapter appointed representants, yeah, who could sign something, something. And in Berlin we saw that those people who did the, did the talking, well, were not active in other ways, or when they talked they, uh, how to put this, we had uh, many people who didn't say anything in the charter discussions and we thought, well, it, it should be fine and it's, it's not too spectacular what we were proposing. But suddenly, in Berlin, many, many people suddenly, they had questions and objections and proposals how to change the draft charter. There was one man who came with two pieces of paper, two sheets of paper with many, many little detailed things he would like to discuss about. We didn't plan in so much time for discussions. And I asked him, yeah, but, but why, why didn't you take part in the discussions before, online? You, you got everything, the documents. Oh, I didn't read them. I, I was taking notes uh, this night in my hotel room. And I thought, yeah, but, but uh, you are the official representative of your chapter and you're coming here to Berlin. And uh, yes, I didn't have the time. And uh, I uh, refrained myself from shouting into the face of this man and asking him, so why don't you, th why, what is about my time you are wasting and the other people's time? And why do you have time to come to Berlin? Costing hundreds of euros from the Wikipedia donors who suppose that people who go on the expenses of a chapter, that they are well prepared for the, for the meeting. Isn't that normal, a normal thing to do? And he wasn't the only one. So somehow, I don't want to go into detail too much, it, it uh, happened in Berlin with a lot of exhausting uh, discussions, also dis exhausting for me, um, to have a charter, we agreed on it, and we were happy to start with the real establishment of the association, the Wikimedia Chapters Association. It was supposed to look like this. You see, one of my hobbies is making charts and diagrams. <laughs> this is a little bit over detail, but I wanted to put in, well, how you become a council member, what does it mean? So the chapter consisted, uh, or it had a council, like a general assembly, one chapter, one council member. How the chapter will, will send this council member, we, we didn't ask. Uh, they uh, were supposed to have him serving for two years. We wanted a period of time in order to have continuity, not changing representants every meeting. And uh, the secretariat, well, it was another word for the board, for people who do executive uh, things. Secretary generally would, general would be the person who's doing things, building something up. And the council had a chair, which means, well, a chair who is uh, dealing with the proceedings, uh, making proposals and see that there are votings, uh, technical stuff. The chair. Right, this was the idea. And for the time between Berlin and April, the meeting was in April, to July, Washington, Wikimania, where we would go on, we would need a kind of interim committee or steering committee uh, who would, would like uh, choose a location and do other things you need in this period of organization. Well, uh, this man you see here is Tomer Ashur from the uh, Israeli chapter, and I confess I kind of talked him in to do that, and uh, he then established a committee of a couple of people who would do that work I was just talking about. And I'm very sorry to say that um, I failed him because later he came to me, he asked me to do something for this, for this uh, association uh, preparing the standing orders and uh, I, I turned him down and said, I'm sorry Toma, I, I think I don't have the time, I have so much to do in, in our Dutch chapter at the moment. Uh, we were hiring a director and uh, I turned him down and uh, later I heard that many, 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 many people turned him down. Uh, I never saw those steering committee members uh, doing anything. And then we came to Washington, Wikimania, and uh, 
Tomer wasn't there. He had visa problems. He couldn't come. <laughs> the steering uh, committee members were not very proactive, to say it leniently, and so I and Ashley, Fair, user Fair, we together had a talk. He's from the British chapter, and um, we consented he would be a candidate for the chair, either candidate for the deputy chair, the, the one who would replace him when he is not around. Right. That worked fine. We were elected, and then we needed a secretary general, a, a, no, the chief of the board, the executive chief. We had two candidates, Tomer and Sebastian Moleski. And to, Tomer, there was a vote about him, and 70% of the council members just voted against him. Later, I talked in the break to one of those council members, why did you vote against? And he said, well, this Toma, he wasn't doing anything. Well, I don't know how qualified he is, and uh, well, uh, he was so inactive. And uh, I, I just thought that person, that council member who talked in that way about Tomea, a uh, very young person, and Tomea is more like my age, uh, younger than me. Um, that council member didn't do anything, at least nothing that I saw, and he had such a strong opinion about Tomer. We had another candidate, Sebastian Moleski, and also he. There wasn't even a vote uh, he withdrew when he saw that so many council members spoke out against him. And I thought, <coughs> we have two candidates, that, that's a luxury in many, many associations, and uh, well, those two people were not good enough for the council members. Wow. Oh yeah, we, we then uh, tried to do something with committees that didn't work because the council members who were in those committees uh, right. Ashley van Heften was our chair in the period July to March and I don't want to go into too much detail. The most important thing of this period maybe was the October plan, as I call it. So we didn't have the secretariat, a volunteer it would have been. So we asked the German chapter and they would support us in, in uh, searching uh, for a secretary general, make a job description and so on. And this generous help of the German chapter was turned down by the council. Something was not good enough. Someone said, I need more discussions a person who never took part in discussions, so I wouldn't know how that had helped him. So, and again, we, we stood there with our bare hands, and uh, maybe Ashley and I should have resigned then, but we went on, tried to find a good location, that's another story, and uh, this period ended in, in February or March, when the Foundation again sent a letter, and they said, uh, we are not going to support that in the FDC or in another way, um, donations money. So um, uh, from us, you will not get money for the Secretary General, uh, which was quite a blow. I understand they saw that the council was just not working. I then, of course, in my role as deputy <coughs> chair of the council, I, I wrote against, you're wrong. And I'm ashamed of that with, uh, now, because I was defending a cause that was partially not defendable. Um, Ashley was replaced by, by Markus Glaser from Germany later as chair, also a great guy, I was happy about that. And yes, we had to go on with a different strategy, and those were the action teams. So the council members were against a volunteer who would be a kind of board member, they were against uh, a chapter helping us with a paid uh, secretary general, and uh, well, let's them do something, let's make action teams, uh, they can do something, there are places where volunteers or others could go in and do something like counseling small chapters, doing outreach, research about the chapters and so on. And as you can imagine, it, it just didn't work. Uh, by the way, some people said that uh, the WCA was a waste of time and money. That wasn't quite true. It was a waste of time, especially of the chair's time and my time. I, uh, to get a voting done in general, most council members didn't turn up to vote, and I had to write <coughs> emails and ask them, please vote, other, other, we wouldn't have a quorum. The vote wouldn't be valid, so I had to babysit those people. Not everyone, there were uh, great council members, but like two-thirds of them hardly active at all. In London, well, about the money, we didn't waste money because we had meetings on Wikimania and the conferences where we would have been anyway. 
Uh, we did uh, expend, uh, spend money for this meeting in London, which was very, very useful. Maybe the most useful of all our meetings and things we did in the association. We did very practical things. Uh, wanted to find out what to do. Very useful. If you want to try it again, do it again. The time of Markus Klaas, because of the time I won't go into details, but um, there's one incident I want to mention. Here in Milan, in the conference, the Wikimedia conference, Fe had a, uh, well, he, he, uh, it was his, his term had ended as chair and Markus Glaser stepped in, and I, as the deputy chair, uh, had bought in Schiphol Stropwafels, and you see th them uh, in front of him, first, uh, first the one on the, uh, on the right. And uh, I said some words of thank because he did a lot of a lot of work. And uh, I don't know about it in other organizations, but he was he was gentle. He was non-confrontative. He was very helpful and supportive. And uh, I had a little speech about that. And then Marcus and some others shook hands and said thank you, fair for your work. Most of the council members just sat where they were behind the laptops as if that was not something that had to do with them. We also had council members who didn't uh, come to the conference, to our meeting, although they were in Milan. About one I heard that he was actually in other cities than Milan uh, for touristic reasons, but uh, that's an exception, but still you have those people. Okay, and as I said, um, it, it, didn't, uh, yeah, it didn't work out with the action teams, no activity. There were two votings, like, um, should we change the name of, this of the association because we opened it for not only chapters, they are thematic organizations, they were new and we thought, well, let, have them, let them have come to our association and uh, we wanted to change the name, it's a charter thing. Markus made a proposal, there were hardly any comments, then we started the vote and the council members said no. They said the proposal was ugly, or uh, were there any other proposals? And uh, I thought, yes, they, the people voted without being prepared at all. And uh, this is something uh, you can do on Wikipedia, vote in that way. It's just unacceptable in an association, in any organization, because the chair makes a proposal, then you must comment on it when you are against it. So you can see, is there support? Or maybe you have uh, an idea to improve the proposal. You must do it then. It is not acceptable just to come up with a no at the end of the day at the voting, destroying the work of those people who actually did something. Now I must look at the time. The end of the, uh, of the WCA was in Hong Kong. When, uh, well, I had many, many doubts about going on. Markus wanted to go on, and uh, Asaf Bartov from the foundation was at our seminar, which we made in Hong Kong, and he said about all the volunteers he's working with, and uh, he's, he's doing uh, about the grants at the foundation, and he said there are so many volunteers and small groups, and people try something out, and it can fail, and that's, that's okay. Yeah, we, we, we don't judge you for that. You try something, we thought it's a good idea, we gave you the money, didn't work out, that's fine. But don't repeat it the next year. Because, yeah, and then I had the idea, well, one year of time for the WCA, it didn't turn out, just because the chapters were not capable in providing us with council members who could do such a thing who would work like a kind of board members. And the uh, one reason uh, which maybe helped to convince Markus not to go on, the French chapter uh, wanted to leave the association. They said, oh, the, it, it's doing nothing, it's a waste of time, they are not doing anything, we leave. And I just thought the French chapter, very not supportive to the association because of inner problems, governance problems and others, the French chapter sends us a totally inactive council member and then it complains about the inactivity of the association. Wow. I was very happy to hear that later some people, several people, went to the French vice president and asked him about that chusper. 
So, we just said we now go away, the association is sleeping, we don't do anything with it uh, anymore, and, well, if you want to go on, we'll, it's not like Wikipedia working on a board or in the association. You can't just revert something, write the next version and so on. In real life, opportunities don't come by all the time. And I hope then that if we want to have a more cooperation of the chapters in future, maybe there are some lessons from the past. And if you have questions about, if you, if you, uh, if you really want to go on with it, I would be happy to be with you and listen to you and maybe yeah, maybe there will be a future for more cooperation between the Wikimedia chapters. Thank you very much, and maybe you have one or two minutes for questions. So do we have any questions? Yeah. I'm rather sad to, to hear from the history of the failure of the association of us as, uh, I mean, I'm here, I'm paid to be here. I'm, I'm paying my staying here, my fares, my hotel, everything. And just to saying that they were sent to Hong Kong, paid by somebody, sent to Milan, sent and paid by somebody, and that, and they did nothing. But I, I, what I can see is that if we are in a global movement, then that is split because we are split in, in several ways, in, by languages, by countries, etc. And we should be coordinated somehow. I mean, it's completely, for instance, people think that you enter the European Union and it's all the same, but if I take a picture in Spain, which is completely legal to upload, in Luxembourg, for instance, it's impossible to upload yeah. legally. Yeah. And that, yeah. kind, that sort of things cannot be sold mm. chapter by chapter, language mm. by language. Yes. But if I send people to, say, agree some something, yes. make some agreement, I, yeah, if I, they don't know anything? They, they have the support necessary for that, that kind of work, yeah. and if chapters can support each other, it's great. If you have, we have 40 chapters, if you have 20 chapters who can help, and 20 who need help, it might work. When you have two or three who might help, could help, and all the rest, and many of them non-active, well, how could that work? Now it works partially because the German chapter had this chapters dialogue, the British chapter, um, the governance seminar, great work, it's done by the big chapters. Why not by the WCA? Because uh, there were people from small chapters who said, well, we cannot trust the big chapters, there's something evil with them. And I said, who picky can you be? If you, you don't like the foundation, you don't want the big chapters, you don't do anything by yourself. Um, are you waiting for a unicorn or what? I hope I had uh, addressed this. Thank you, sir. We've got time for one more quick question, if anyone has a question. No? Yeah, okay. Hi, Zico. Um, looking back on your experience with all the possibilities that were presented for the chapters, is there something that we could still do now? Just one takeaway thing that you'd recommend to us that we could do in cooperation with each other mm. to start to, to build the tiny little bridges and, and the little structures between the chapters that one day might lead towards a, a, another, perhaps more strongly founded chapters association. Okay. Where can we start? Yeah, thank you very much for that question because it goes to the future and I, I, um, I hope I didn't draw the atmosphere too much down. I want to be positive and look into the future. So we have seen these things. I think uh, for next try, one shouldn't do it globally, but only in Europe just because of time zones. Yeah, in this London meeting, only Europeans were there. It wouldn't make uh, Derek from Hong Kong who was living in London. Uh, that makes sense, but not globally. And um, you shouldn't accept every chapter because sometimes an association has the right to call itself a chapter, thanks to the foundation, but they are so feeble. Uh, you cannot expect from them having a council member or something like that. And uh, practically for the next future, we see that many chapters are doing things that are good for the whole world, like the British are doing and others. So maybe you can better, the chapters could better divide those things, sitting together and saying, well, we, I think we in the Netherlands, we are good with 
a glam with outreach to museums and so on. We would like to, like to specialize on that in a certain way, uh, organizing international Wikimedia events about that. Great, we could do that. So the Italians are good with that. And in Sweden, they have this, those experiences. So if, if you have that kind of coordination and the actual orga organizing of those events would be done by one chapter, and not by a council, you wouldn't uh, expect too much from. I hope I could address uh, a little bit what you said. Thank you. Yes, optimistic is uh, what I want to give with you for for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zico. That was uh, cooperation between chapters. Um, the next talk is by Itzik, uh, and it's the role of media in development of Wikipedia. Uh, Hi. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Itzik Edry. I'm for the last seven years, I'm the spokesperson of Wikimedia Israel, and over the last two years, I'm also the chairman. So yes, I'm doing two roles. I don't really have life, sorry. And today, I want to speak with you about the role of the media in the development of Wikipedia. But as I'm Facebook addicted and social media addicted in general, so first of all, picture. So please smile and say Jimmy Wales. Nice, thank you. So let's start. So the first question we need to ask ourselves is why we need uh, the media, why we need communication and press. We know that everyone knows what is Wikipedia. It's not new uh, to no one. And we will not earn more money if more visitors will come to the website because they saw an article about Wikipedia. Uh, we already have enough money through the fundraising uh, for our needs. And we don't really have a big boss that loves to see himself on the uh, main, uh, main covers of a magazine or loves to see himself on the press. A lot of it told me two days ago that back in 2009, on the first chapters meeting that they had in Berlin, they tried to agree on SWOT that reflect the movement back then. They agreed that press is oh opportunity for our movement, opportunity to grow and become much bigger through the press and to bring more uh, new editors. Two years later, in 2011, on the same meeting and the same session, pre press become T as a threat to the movement, as a possible threat, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, back to T threat. So they're afraid that if you will not use the press correctly and if the press will start publish bad, bad articles on Wikipedia, that will affect the brand, the volunteers and the movement in general. But let's continue to ask ourselves why we need why we need the press. From my point of view, Wikipedia first based it on its volunteers' pride, and the volunteers are not earning money. And most of the people don't know that you are, and many others are the people that behind Wikipedia. But I think that in every piece of art, uh, of piece of press, and every uh, TV report or every magazine that. Uh, they show, they, they saw uh, article, something uh, reporting about Wikipedia, 
they feel a little bit more proud because they know they have part of this change. And the press is a big uh, opportunity for us to help them to feel this uh, kind of feeling and pride uh, to take part of this project. However, we're still using the press in order to bring a, to give our, our volunteers opportunity uh, to interview and to tell what they think about Wikipedia and project that they are taking part of. And I see just I see the number of volunteers that want to interview to the press just increase, and we saw a lot of volunteers over the past uh, days interview to many press that came here to cover Wikimedia. However. 13, 13 years after, we are still using the media to explain to everyone what is Wikipedia. And although it seems like it should be obvious that Wikipedia is free and everyone can edit on Wikipedia, this is not the case. Even today, 23% of the public don't know that they can edit on Wikipedia. 36% don't know how to edit on Wikipedia. 18% say that they don't know that they, they don't think they have the right to edit on Wikipedia. And these numbers are based on a survey that's conducted by panels, uh, a very famous uh, research, uh, research company in Israel two months ago. More numbers. Uh, 37 of the responders think that only people that have been approved by site administrators can edit on Wikipedia. And around 13% 30, of the, the people that answer to the, to the survey think that Wikipedia editors are only research or students from the academy. So we still have an image to change in public. But, okay, if we agree that we need the press, but many other organizations as well want to be covered on the, on the press, uh, but are the media are interesting in Wikipedia? So I think the, the answer is really obvious, yes. And we see the number of stories every month covering Wikipedia. And before I came here to Wikimedia, I spoke with some of my colleagues from the press and, as, and under, to try to understand why they like to cover Wikipedia and why they like to write about Wikipedia. So first of all, volunteerism. They know that everyone doing it voluntarily. Even the spokesperson is a volunteer. And they know that when they want to interview someone, I will be, uh, prefer to give them a, a, a volunteer uh, rather than uh, one of my paid staff. And one of them say, say, told me that he really appreciate uh, this fact compared to other charity organizations that love to push their staff rather than their, their volunteers. They like Wikipedia. They're using the website every day like every other person on the planet. For one end, its, it's popularity is like Google, Facebook, and others. But on the second end, we are not commercial website and we are not earning more money if we will get another free uh, media coverage and we will not cut our uh, advertising budget if we will get more free media coverage again. We are not selling them nothing, anything, sorry. Not like otherwise, uh, not like other companies who sometimes sell news that are not really news or trying to push initiatives that haven't been started yet just to get a free uh, a cover on the, on the media. We are contacting, we are contact, sorry, contacting the press only when we have something uh, really important and really interesting to say. And the readers like us, and it's very simple. When the readers want to uh, read more about specific issue, the reporter is writing, writing more about this issue. But when we look on how, it, how Wikipedia work in, uh, in what related to communication, it's really different from other companies or organization. Wikipedia for a spokesperson can be a nightmare. Spokesperson usually uh, control everything in organization from my point of view as a spokesperson. A discussion about changes, for example, or new project are taking part behind uh, closed doors, allowing the spokesperson to control when you want to publish the news and to who you want to give the news. In our movement, the transparency is what is the major power that, con that control. When, for example, when we're having the visual editorial launch, one of the reporter can easily find when we're going to do it and how we're going to do it on Meta or every other page on Wikipedia. Uh, when the Wikimedia uh, committee announced that, that Haifa is going to host Wikimedia in 2011, 
I got a phone call uh, from one of the reporter less than a, one hour later pushing me to send a press release even that I didn't plan to do it on the same day because it was a very bad day to communicate such news in the Israeli media. And we need to remember that in Wikipedia, everyone is the spokesperson. Every employee in a big organization or a big uh, charity need to get approved uh, from the spokesperson in order to be interviewed. Here in Wikipedia, most of the time the reporter are contact directly one of the editors and you can say whatever you want. And this fact only can drive crazy most of the spokesperson that I know. So how the communication in our movement is, work, is working. We have the uh, Wikimedia, uh, the foundation, the communication staff, and I'm not going to talk about, a lot about them because they have another session, I think, in one hour from now in the same room. But the communication in, in the movement are based generally on volunteers. There are chapters that have spokesperson, but most of them are not getting paid, and most of them are, don't even uh, come from a knowledge of how to work with press and media. Moreover, most of the countries don't have a chapter or person who coordinate the press, so it's, the press is usually contacting directly editors every time and other editors. And most of our volunteers in our movement uh, who handle the press are member in what we call the ComCom, the Communication Committee. Uh, we share between them ideas, uh, press clipping and marketing plans, or that at least what we thinking that we are doing. Someone here is from the ComCom, is member of, of the ComCom? Yeah, I see one, two. Yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> Don't forget that we have a meeting after Lila's speech. Uh, to summarize, we are very small. Just imagine how many people are involved in marketing and press in Google or Facebook or any other, or any other uh, website in the, f in the fifth list of the biggest website. But this small uh, uh, group of people are kind of ninjas that can do amazing media uh, collaborative project, exactly like Wikipedia. And one of them, it's the 10th anniversary of Wikipedia. And I think it's the best example that show how, how much power we have as a group. Uh, back then we had more than 470 events in more than 100 different countries, which led to a massive press cover around the world. And back in 2011 for Wikimedia in Haifa, we made a short movie to summarize the celebration. And I want to show you the movie, if it's going to work. On the 15th of January, 2011, Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, completed its first decade. The occasion was not left unnoticed. No less than 470 events celebrated Wikipedia's 10th anniversary in every inhabited continent and at every corner of the world. Barbecue parties, meetups at pizzerias, gatherings at cinema halls and theaters. Each group of Wikipedians chose its special setting, but in all cases, these were community events of people who wished to work together for a good cause. Wikipedia's decennial turned out to be the single largest, most widely celebrated event of the Wikimedia movement so far. During the past 10 years, Wikipedia has come to mean so much to so many people. It brought together millions of people who have this thing in common, the belief that free access to knowledge is something every human being deserves. Today, Wikipedia receives 400 million unique visits every single month. It has 18 million articles in 270 languages. Wikipedia is the fifth most popular web property in the world. Thank you to all of those who contributed and keep contributing to the editors, the donors, and the supporters. Thank you to all those who believe in our mission and help us walk this challenging path. So, what makes this event very uh, unique and successful in what related to marketing? It's the fact that for the first time, I think the communication uh, team, sorry, I lost my voice two days ago, and I'm still trying to recover. 
So, for the first time, all, the gr all this group, uh, together with the foundation and the volunteers from around the world, plan together how we're going to celebrate and how we're going to market, uh, how we're going to do the marketing around it. And the foundation team has done great work uh, with collecting a lot of facts and writing uh, position papers and Q&A and a lot of historical facts that help us to push a, a lot of stories on the press. They also made a fantastic uh, designs that everyone can adopt and using uh, on his country in order to print t-shirt or brochure and you can see why some of them on the screen. And if I'm looking for the best way, for the best work model that we can dream on, the celebration was one of them. And last year we had another uh, 10 anniversary celebration. Now to the Hebrew Wikipedia. And our strategy in our chapter was to show the volunteers, the people behind the project. So each major report presented another volunteers. Uh, and in order to show the power of Wikipedia, we collected again a lot of numbers. Uh, how many uh, edits been done until now, how many words are on, we on Hebrew Wikipedia, uh, what are the most viewed articles over, uh, uh, over the past five years. And this again led for a, a lot of press clipping that we saw. But besides arranging a massive cover, coverage for the celebration, we were looking for a special way to celebrate, to do something that never been done before. So I contacted a good friend of mine, Gidon Amichai, he, that is one of the famous advertising uh, executive in Israel. And we together created a collaborative, collaborative project with Channel 2, that it's one of the most viewed channels in Israel. And because it's hard for me to speak, let's see another movie about it. Yeah. Wikipedia helps people all over the world. When we received Hebrew Wikipedia's 10th anniversary brief, we thought it was about time that media people who use Wikipedia regularly should return the favor. We collaborated with Channel 2 News, Israel's leading channel, and initiated the Creating an Article project. Every day, one of the top journalists in the country wrote a new article for the Hebrew Wikipedia using his or her expertise, wealth of personal knowledge, and storytelling skills. Each reporter starred in a one-minute video item sharing his or her decision to write about a specific topic and the research they've done. <laughs> for two weeks, the Creating an Article project was part of the daily news broadcast. It opened with a discussion in the newsroom, followed by a video of the journalists. Channel 2 News used its social media networks to generate more engagement and invite people to be part of the Wikipedia community. The project was viewed by over 2 million people in a country of only 8 million. During the month of the campaign, Hebrew Wikipedia's page view growth was up by 9%, reaching a record of 67.4 million viewed pages. By comparison, the same month's worldwide average page view growth was up by only 1%. Please help Wikipedia with your creative talent. So, not like past event, this time we tried to measure if, there are, if the celebration have a kind of effect on the Hebrew Wikipedia. And of course, it's not absolu absolutely proven uh, that it related, but on the celebration month, page view on Wikipedia increased by 12%, and uh, compared to 1% uh, worldwide. And the number of new articles on Hebrew Wikipedia grow was 12% as well, uh, compared to 14% uh, decrease uh, worldwide. So if the media covers uh, really affect Wikipedia, this is something the, the, to, up to you to judge. But what, right now I see message on my computer that PowerPoint is shutting down.
yeah, you can see it, but, but yeah, that happens. <coughs> Anyway, it's worth to mention that for this uh, PR campaign, uh, Wikimedia Israel won last, got last month, uh, or sorry, received last month uh, the Rolling Lion Award, that it's award for excellency within the Israeli communication and public relations in industry in Israel, awarded by the Public Relations Association. So this is how the statue look like. And what next? I tried many times to think how we can replicate the successful of the 10th anniversary celebration. And I had many talks, talks with volunteers uh, in our movement. And during the past years, the amazing, the amazing Victor and, his story, and the storytelling uh, team from the foundation interviewed thousands of, thousand, sorry, thousand of uh, Wikimedians telling their personal story. But they are only a small part of our community, not talk about our readers. Now try to imagine on a single day, or maybe on the next Wikipedia uh, birthday, that we will, we will invite uh, the, five, uh, sorry, the 500 million Wikipedia visitor and the 80,000 Wikipedia editor to share one minute story about Wikipedia. Maybe to show, to show the place that they like to uh, sit and edit on Wikipedia or what they like to read on Wikipedia, or maybe the defect of why they're editing on Wikipedia or telling another person uh, that they are the people behind a specific article. Imagine a thousand of short videos from places around the world instead of uh, p uh, videos from a studio with the same white screen behind. And try, and try to imagine how we combine it to a, a short video. My Wikipedia mo uh, moment, for example. And this is my vision for the next uh, collaborative communication project that we can do together. And of course, and I believe that every one of you have his idea or vision that we can do. So just think about it and let's select a project that we can do together and do it. Thank you. <laughs> Question or something? Thank you. Any questions? Uh, this project create an article. Um, what was your counterpart? Who, uh, who was your counterpart? Article? This project create an article with yeah. the journalist two weeks. Who was your counterpart? Who was your partner to do this? Uh, Channel 2. As a TV station? Yeah, it's, it's, a very, it's the, the most popular TV station in Israel. So we contacted them with the idea to do something like that. Uh, at the start, when Gideon and Michai was the one that brought the idea, and when he told me that you're going to Channel 2 uh, to offer them the idea, I told him, I told him, good luck with that. I'm sure they will kick you out from, will kick you out from the room, you know, to give you one minute every time on the prime time to speak about Wikipedia for free. And he called me uh, uh, one hour after we talked. It was before he entered to the, to the meeting with the CEO, and then he told me. I managed, I managed to do it, they're going to do it, and they like it very much. So it was a kind of shock, but it's happened yeah. there. <laughs> and these videos are under free license, free license you showed it to us? No, it's not a free license. I'm Too sorry. bad. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a commercial TV. More uh, questions? Need a computer after me? Um, well, that will be the next question, from, <laughs> actually, from me, because I'm not sure if the third speaker has arrived. Yeah, we have. Yeah, OK, good. Uh, any more questions? Wait a sec. I was interested that you said that um, you like volunteers to interact with the media. Do, do you give the volunteers any kind of media training? Usually in Israel, uh, before people are uh, going to uh, be an interview by the press, if I'm sending them to the press, so I'm usually uh, briefing them a little bit about talking points. But in general, we are not controlling what volunteers are going to say. They're free to say whatever they want. If they want to get, you know, maybe ideas uh, how to uh, behave or in general, when they go into, a, for example, for a TV interview, so I'm telling them not to wear this kind of shirt or, or another, you know, personal uh, 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 tips. But in general, volunteers can say whatever they want. And does that, that's a bit, does that worry you? There's kind of, does that, introduce an element of risk? No, I think that 
again, it came about uh, Israel, that we build kind of trust with the volunteers that most of the time, even a if a reporter contact one of the, uh, one, of the uh, one of the editors directly, they notified me about it in order me to know that a reporter contacted them. So most of the time I'm, again, giving the uh, more briefing about what the, uh, what the story is about and how to uh, uh, behave with this kind of reporters because if I know him, so I know what he's interested more about and other things. Um, I really like the way you linked, you know, the, the page views and the, um, the article creation after that, and it was an obvious probably bounce, you know, because um, a lot of times people just say, well, you know, like, uh, you know, we had media exposure, but they don't really talk about, like, what could have happened because of that. And so, although it's good, but still in the end of the day, you like to think, you know, we are here to create something, right? right. So it's really good you, you did that. Do you have suggestions, perhaps, about how people can go about if they're thinking about media exposure, like, you know, capturing that data so they're able to be sure to be able to show that link between, um, you know, the media and also, you know, on-site, ch you know, changes? It's really hard because in most of the time you're getting, you know, one report in a week on, on you know, I don't know, on one of the newspaper or one TV report. Uh, in this case, because it was a kind of a celebration that covered, you know, for two weeks, uh, most of it on, was on Channel 2 and a lot of uh, press in every uh, major uh, newspaper or in every uh, radio station and every TV station in Israel. So we knew that it was a massive uh, press cover that we can check. Most of the time if you have, you know, you know ev even if you have a great uh, TV report about you, you will not see a big increase on Wikipedia. And again, this is the number that I, I pull out from the data. It's not mean that I can't be, you know, assured that you assure you that it's because of the press. But it's making sense that that if you, if we've been in the press for two weeks and uh, repeat the same, you know, uh, messaging that everyone can edit in Wikipedia, and suddenly we see increase in the number of uh, articles, especially if we compare it to what's going on worldwide that we saw in uh, decrease. So maybe it's F connection. Um, besides. Uh media coverage and also getting media houses to participate in editing certain articles or creating certain articles. Have you thought about um, acquiring archive material that you can, can be freely licensed and embedded into Wikipedia articles? Have you thought about that? Because I see that often the media companies or organizations do have a stash of audio and video content that could make very good multimedia content for Wikipedia. Have you thought about such collaborations with the media? The true way uh, that a month after the celebration, uh, we had another meeting with uh, the executive director of the Channel 2, of the, the news department, and again, uh, tr try to convince him uh, to, to give some of the uh, video that he have on archive. And we had a lot of uh, a very long discussion about it, and continue after the the meeting itself. But at the end, we didn't successful to met, to convince them to uh, to do it. Again, it's commercial TV, and this is what they earn money for. And uh, video for them worth a lot of money, and to give it for free to Wikipedia, we didn't imagine yet to uh, to convince them to do it. Um, um, what about very old content that is probably in the public domain but was acquired by through journalistic like you know activities or reports because I know that in the UK for the BBC for example they have very very old documentaries of historical events which happened all around the world and um, I mean I'm just saying this because it's it's a shame that you go onto some of these Wikipedia articles and you just keep reading, keep reading, and you don't see any illustration of any form in any kind of media. So if it's, even if it's not about recent events, you know, there are certain archive file materials that are very old and are probably in the public domain anyways. Did you heard about GLAM? Yes, I have. Okay. So yeah. most of the time we're doing this collaborative project through the GLAM with archive and museums. Uh, Again, we didn't yet do something like that with a TV channel or a radio station in Israel. I know that uh, Wikimedia UK done something with uh, the radio station in uh, uh, here in UK to release some of uh, reco some recordings, and 
I will be happy to see in Israel and in, in general in the world the kind of a glam with the TV channel. But again, it's again it's also a very complicated because. Let's take, for example, uh, some of the reports that Channel 2 have. It's not only based on or of their footage. It's also footage that's coming from Reuters, and it's coming from AP. And they have a soundtrack that is copyrighted by another company, so it's really hard to, to give you the video. Uh, so what we spoke with Channel 2, for example, is to get the, food, uh, the footage itself from some uh, national events that they are covering, for example. Uh, but again, we didn't manage yet to do it, but we are still dreaming about it. That's it. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks. It's a good So that was uh, the role of media and development of Wikipedia. Uh, now we have John, I hope, somewhere from... Uh, Royal Society, who's going to talk about um, what a scientific Wikipedian in residence does. Hi, yeah. Um, uh, this is a change to the printed program. Uh, it's a change to the printed program because the uh, the journalism uh, presenter has dropped out, so uh, we've been asked to step in and do uh, what does a, a Wikipedia in residence in the scientific sector do? But fortunately, um, one of the speakers is uh, Henry Scowcroft from Cancer Research UK, who can also cover uh, what Wiki can teach journalism and the other way around, which was the original topic a bit. <laughs> so we're going to try and do both. Um, uh, let's just introduce ourselves first. I'm uh, John Byrne, usually John Bod. Uh, I've been working in 2014 as Wikipedian in Residence, first at the Royal Society, which is the UK's National Academy of the Sciences. Uh, that was January to early July, uh, but only one day a week. So, uh, al although at the early part of the year I, I spent much more time than that, in fact. And then since May, uh, I've been working four days a week for Cancer Research UK, which is the world's largest cancer research charity, a very large organisation dedicated to funding research into cancer. Uh, so very much scientific. And there Henry is uh, my boss. He'll introduce himself in a minute. And we have also Sydney Poor. Sydney, would you like to explain? Uh, yes, I mean, I'm hoping this microphone is working. Thanks, is it? Okay, good. Um, I'm Sydney Poor. I, um, my username is Flo Knight, which is short for Florence Nightingale. So early on in my editing career in 2005, I had just read a revisionist history of Florence Nightingale and came and was writing medical articles. So I've had this long interest in how to you know, um, improve the quality of health content on Wikipedia for quite a long while. Um, I also ha I wear the hat of being on the Fund Dissemination Committee and have had the opportunity to read a lot of proposals and um, um, impact reports about what chapters are doing around the world, having Wikipedia as a residence in the science areas. And more recently, I have become um, a part-time remote Wikipedia in residence with Cochrane Co Collaboration, which is an international group that does um, reviews of medical trials. So I have some experience that I hope to be able to share uh, on this topic. Hi, I'm Henry. So as John said, I, I work for Cancer Research UK. Um, my background, I have a degree in molecular biology from many moons ago and a master's in communicating science. And I work for the charity essentially trying to com communicate about what the charity is doing in terms of research, but also the wider field of cancer research to the public, to patients, to journalists, uh, on social media, there's a whole wide range of audiences. Um, I think we'll talk, just um, to go back to sort of talk to, about John and the Royal Society before I do, just to say why why we're involved in this. We sort of we we own a, a well, we run a very large information website about cancer for patients, and over the years we noticed that we were sort of there's this other website coming up top of the Google rankings alongside us called Wikipedia, 
Um, and we said, oh, well, we've got to optimize, optimize our website a bit better and try and sort of knock them off the top. And after a while, I realized that was never going to happen for a lot of the search terms and topics. So it occurred to a few of us that maybe actually trying to work out how to, to get involved with editing the, the content about cancer and, and scientific research on, on Wikipedia would be a good idea. Um, and that was back in 2010-11, so there's been a fair amount of stuff we've done since then, so I'll be talking a bit about that today. Okay, um, and Henry, you've also had a bit of, uh, I, mean, I mean, we work in the uh, press and science communication mm. department, so we work alongside uh, a whole press team and That's a, right, lot yeah. of, a lot of the work. So is my day-to-day -day job at Cancer Research UK is, is in a sort of sort of new team that's only been going for a couple of years that sits alongside the press team. So the press team do the traditional sort of things that a press office would do, which is um, sending out press releases about stuff that we've done, but also fielding comments from journalists about stuff other people have done where they want to comment from us as a, as a, as a large respected organisation. Um, the advent of free digital publishing meant that we suddenly realised that some, for some of our stuff we didn't have to get a journalist to write about it because we could just go and register a WordPress account and write about it ourselves. And so my main, the predominant bit of my role at Cancer Research UK is writing directly to the news format stuff, creating infographics and, and videos, video content um, to convey that sort of stuff directly to the public. And a good example of that was, some of you would have noticed in the media this week was a big story about whether aspirin could be taken to prevent cancer. And a lot of the stuff we did about, about that this week was trying to put those statistics in, con in, in, in context, trying to put it in context with previous research, and um, pushing that out, all that sort of information out in the form of graphics and blog articles into social media so that people could kind of really try and get, get their heads around what the, what the story was trying to say because the media often tries to take a kind of, quite, quite understandably, a much more sort of punchy, direct view of these things rather than getting caught up in all the nuances about everything. This isn't this isn't this this is uh, what we did on Thursday. But I I, I haven't been I'm, I think I'm not the only one. I haven't been able to get it on the internet all day. So I was going to pull out pull down a few links, uh, but I'm not. So I, I have the old slide that I may go to that's that's kind of relevant. Um, I was going to say I was going to add to the person one of the my key contacts at Cochrane is the person who works in the in communications as well because mm -hmm. large part like what Wikipedia does is really disseminating health information Cochrane has realized as well that you know you need a large part of what they're doing is disseminating information so we really share the space so mm -hmm. a lot of us in, including how they disseminate you know their new information to Wikipedians so that they can actually then put it in the health article. So this big space to work in, in terms of what we call the media, mm. or, you know, communications is very much shared by all of us, media including yeah. Wikipedians. And Wikimedians are are um, needing to understand how to tap into some of these ways of that uh, health organizations are disseminating content. Media used to be something you got on a piece of paper at breakfast and on yeah. television at six o'clock in the evening, and now it's a thing you get on your phone, on your computer screen while you're at work all day. So we've got, a, you know, organisations like Cochrane, like Cancer Research UK, are finding we've really got to adapt to this new, mm -hmm. new world out there. And of course, Wikipedia is playing an increasingly big role in all of that. But I think the key, and I've been been struck with this uh, very much, come moving into a press environment, is the the, the big difference between Wikipedia and the media, whether it's traditional or electronic, is of course that we're an encyclopedia uh, and also in a media repository on Commons and the rest of it. They are press and they are story driven. Mm. Press is interested in stories, social media is interested in stories. You know, monkey selfie, <laughs> three days, the whole world's seeing it, then it's gone. Uh, in terms of cancer and science, uh, the story, well, this, the science stories that the press like are breakthrough, generally. And in cancer, it's breakthrough and also, um, you know, Call. young Call. victims, yeah. young victims, uh, interesting victims, not old people with, with, with cancer, which is most of the people who get cancer. Uh, but untypical teenagers with cancer and breakthrough and, and half the emails that I see are responses by our uh, very good science communications team responding to yet another story uh, 
it would be unfair to mention the Daily Mail, <laughs> single out the Daily Mail, because actually, occasionally, the Daily Mail actually does is starting to do quite good stories on cancer. Uh, but but all the media, you know, a scientist does a primary study uh, and puts it up, and the media that is a story, and they will go with it. Whereas in uh, Wikipedia's medical coverage, which uh, I think to a certain extent, Wikipedia. Uh, the, the, the medical team on Wikipedia actually enforce the policies that the whole site is supposed to enforce uh, and they have especially tough uh, um, requirements through MedMOS, uh, WP MedMOS and WP MedRS uh, on what kind of stuff you can put in medical articles and what kind of sourcing you can use and you can't put in uh, unfortunately, people are always trying to do this. You can't add uh, something you read in your paper about a primary study, possibly on mice. You know, people spend it, lots of people come along and being helpful, put that story into the relevant article, and it will get knocked out again. Um, whereas, you know, it will it will have had some kind of story uh, in some of the press hopefully accompanied by a sort of damping down statement by one of our colleagues because uh, that's what they spend an awful lot of time doing. Uh, I, I was, um, a few years ago I helped Wikimedia UK get charitable status and I had to do a sort of long reports or long correspondence to them which involved me doing a lot of uh, research which actually I found very interesting and uh, I was very struck by a report uh, that uh, unfortunately I can't provide the link but if you google I think it's American Society of Toxicologists uh, and Wikipedia uh, in about 2008 the American Society of, of Toxicologists it's defi that's definitely the word um, circularized their membership uh, with a questionnaire about uh, toxicology in the media and I think they got 800 responses out of, out of maybe 2,000 members or something. Uh, so it's quite a decent sample. And uh, they were basically asked a whole load of questions that re researchers uh, had posed about uh, various media sources and how well they covered toxico toxicological issues. And uh, the top of the poll was, I think it's Med, Med, Medline or whatever, one of the big uh, US medical sites. Second came Wikipedia. Third came the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, some way behind Wikipedia, which is slightly alarming, I think, if you're an American taxpayer, because, <laughs> uh, you know, the toxicologists feel that, that the FDA is, I think the problem was that the, the uh, and then the rest of the media, New York Times, all of that was way down, you know. Uh, and I think the reason for that is because toxicologists are constantly bombarded by primary studies, probably on mice, showing that something or other might do something, something nasty medic medically. Uh, and thousands of these studies come out and the press love them because they're a story. Whereas Wikipedia, will not or should not put them in uh, and that's I think why we got that kind of level of respect more than the FDA because I guess the toxicologists think the FDA are sort of scaredy cats who put that kind of stuff on their site I guess um, but I think I think that's the that's the main thing that journalism might learn from wiki although I guess there's absolutely no prospect of them doing so because they will continue to be story driven because that's what they do. They need news, we just need articles that are relatively permanent. What can we learn from journalism? Personally, I think that there's no question uh, we can learn accessible style, especially in the medical area. And we can also, we, we should learn that what journalists all know in terms of the old press formats actually most people just read the first paragraph. I think a lot of Wikipedian writers, I actually come from a, a, a book, a, re, a, a reference publishing book, you know, print background, 
which is kind of unusual. Uh, also, journalists, you actually don't get many, uh, you know, career journalists editing Wikipedia. Uh, I've worked with journalists a lot uh, because most of the people who wrote the reference stuff were actually technically journalists. And one thing I've noticed about journalists, that, that they're very strongly of the opinion that if you write something for publication, you ought to get paid for it. They, they have that very firmly in their heads. Also, another point to check in here. So I used to very briefly, um, well, for about three or four years, um, run a module on a science journalism course. And um, a couple of years in, I started getting emails from the faculty saying, why are you encouraging all your students to link to Wikipedia as a, as a, as a reference on your web copy? And I hadn't come from a journalist background. I came from an from a online, um, online information background, where if you have a top topic that needs defining, you link to a page that will define it. But in the world of journalism, that's seen as linking to a source, which is a very different distinction. And um, because journalism doesn't trust Wikipedia to be right, there's a blanket ban across this university um, school of journalism that student journalists shouldn't link to Wikipedia at all under any circumstances, which I think is some, certainly not the way I think anyone who works. I see, I see links to Wikipedia on Guardian. They do occasionally. The Guardian Science Desk are a bit more enlightened about stuff like this, but, but, across, but across the School of Journalism at City University, there's a very old-fashioned view on this, which is that Wikipedia, because it might be wrong, you shouldn't ever send anyone there at all. So I think there's definitely a bit of work for the Wikipedia community, the Wikimedia community and the journalistic community to kind of actually have a bit of a discussion at some point about how this could all work together, um, yeah. because it's, it's, it seems to be a sort of slightly ludicrous idea that trainee journalists are being told that they'll, they'll get docked marks for li linking to a website that contains quite a lot of good stuff in it. Um, as, as well, we actually had some really bad press, medical-wise, where, oh, cool. there, where there was this, uh, and it splashed across the headlines and it's still reverberating today about, you know, very erroneous uh, leads of articles saying that 90% of the medical journal, uh, medical articles were, were had errors in them, which wasn't even what the study said, but that was sounded really sexy to say that, you know, in the, in the media. And so uh, we had to spend, you know, quite a bit of time as medical editors trying to defend this, you know, research it, understand it, and work with it, and then come out with our own responses. And we had support of, you know, our partners, you know, like Cochrane and also the UK, who, was, you know, were very supportive of and, us. And Kat, and, and yeah, I, yeah. I did a yeah, exactly. you know, blog very post on cancer of, research, yeah. of, of, of correcting the misconceptions mm -hmm. about this. And the Guardian so did a very good article. Right, so we simply need to figure out, like, how to tell our story so that mm -hmm. we can, ref you know, refer, because there was a delay, you know, we, we had, it took us a little time, well, although we quickly tried to respond to this, um, we, we didn't have something immediately ready. So we lived for a few weeks' time with, um, you know, a very uncomfortable feeling, uh, not being able to point to something. So I think us learning how to tell our stories about um, how, what we're doing, how well we're doing it is going to be uh, something we'll learn and will, will be important for us to do regularly. Okay, maybe we better move on. Uh, I mean, I just, to wrap up on the journalism, I think, you know, journalists know their, know the market they're writing for. And they understand, I think most of our leads are too short, uh, you know, and most Wikipedians seem to believe that people actually read to the bottom of the page, the bottom at the end of the article. They don't, you know. Uh, the majority of people just read the lead or the first paragraph of the lead or the first sentence of the lead, and that's it. And I think that's a lesson that we could take on board. Okay, I guess we'd better move on to what does a Wikipedian uh, in residence in the scientific sector do and uh, quickly I mean it's essentially often it, it, it varies with the institution and the nature of the role uh, we've had uh, I've had two roles that have had one, one was one day a week for six months the other one is was effectively full-time for six months stretched to four days a week uh, seven and a half months those are very different slots of time and what you can accomplish in those is radically different. And the nature of the institutions are radically different. So there's, it's kind of hard to generalize. There will always be, I think, training involved. Right. Uh, we're always doing training internally and often, uh, usually offering it externally as well. Um, but what you're training, who you're training, that varies quite a lot. Um, images. I guess you don't have much image 
No, it wouldn't be images as much. You know, we're we're in some ways we're really targeted on the fact. I mean, we're very lucky. They have very they have they write uh, review articles, and so you know us putting the review articles into Wikipedia is just a very much a core activity. But we oh. do share other things, in it. and so part of what my job right now is with them, and I am working ten hours a week for uh, six months remotely because they are a global organization just like Wikipedia is so it's sending me to their headquarters in London would not help because you know they're all over the world <laughs> so like I'm doing um, you know uh, go to meetings and Skype calls with people all, all over the world talking to them in their location so but what we're doing is understanding where we overlap on things like translation is something we all share talking in a plain language is something we're all dealing with. So like we're finding common areas and in, in really understanding how we can support each other in working in these ways. So we're still scoping some of this out right now because that's part of what my job was, was to come in and understand better you know, how we can work together and how we can support each other in, in really putting out high quality um, health information that's open and free. <laughs> it's a key thing. Yeah, right. And I mean, uh, the Royal Society and Council Research have both had images as a, uh, you know, the release of images to Commons as a component. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to link to. We just last week uploaded uh, just under 400 uh, body diagrams. Uh, there's one of them anyway, uh, which are actually very useful. And these are, uh, you know, for, for the medical articles, which tend, cancer articles tend to be illustrated by you know, revolting tumour photos or, uh, you know, slides uh, from, from a pathology which uh, are meaningless, uh, you know, to anyone who's not a pathologist or medical student. Uh, and the Royal Society, they're also just uploading. Uh, one thing I was able to do was to get them to agree. They wouldn't release most of the historic stuff in their uh, relatively small collection, but they have great manuscripts. Uh, but they are, uh, they've introduced a policy where the new fellows, the official photos, will be released on Commons, and those just went up in the last couple of days. Uh, Henry, did you want to? Yeah, I, was just, I thought it might be useful or helpful to, to sort of people who sort of turn up for the session to know a little bit about background about why we have a Wikipedia in residence. And I think the, the short version, because I think we've only got about seven or eight minutes left. Yeah. Get some questions as well. yeah. yeah. In that essentially, we, 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 we wanted to get involved with editing Wikipedia. We had a training academy from some of the guys at Wikimedia UK. And then we went back to, to our desks and nothing happened because we didn't have time because it wasn't our jobs to do anything. So we, we realised that we really needed to, 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 to um, get this sorted, get something working. So we put together a funding bid. We got some funding from the Wellcome Trust um, for, to fund the position. Um, John, as he said, has been with us for six months. And just very briefly, the four key things that we're focusing on, as, as John said, is, is image release under Creative Commons. And this sort of stuff is absolutely invaluable for, for medical content. Um, also, as John mentioned, training both within the charity, so just getting other members of staff up to speed with knowing what Wikipedia is and how it works, which, as, as we saw from the previous session, not a lot of people know. Um, the third bit is... Well, we're doing some is, research, um, well, which is unusual. Research us, but the content improvement is kind yeah. of the interesting one, because we, ca we have the expertise in-house, in but the, the, a lot of the, the, the resources outside of Wikipedia in the community, so trying to plug the external Wikipedia editing community into our internal expertise in, in the form of our statisticians, our clinicians, our researchers, um, and finally some research. And we're going to be doing a session later on today at 5.30 in Frobisher 456, talking about some of the issues we're going to be exploring with the research. But to, to summarise it all, mainly focuses on who are our readers and what do they want from us, because I don't think anyone knows. Of medical content on, on Wikipedia. Um, so, okay. Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, I just say the, 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 the content, the, the, in, the, in cancer research, the, what we're doing in content is very sort of kind of specific, we're focusing on particular articles, and that's an interesting approach that I think is, is original. Uh, okay, yep. I think we've got one here. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, John knows I, I, I support very much the sort of interaction, what, what Henry was talking about, and um, I'm wondering, what sort of ideas you might have to continue um, so it's a sort of interface but after we, after my term uh, yeah I mean, uh, in, in in general also with Cochrane um, yeah. uh, it wasn't just a um, well one of the things that you know 
we were talking about because in this particular instance, they have um, ways that their reviews are, are published. They know when they're public, going to be published. They know which ones. They internally think about how to disseminate them and decide which ones to prioritize is you know disseminating, which is very useful information for Wikipedia. And so we're trying to figure out you know good systems that we can put in place permanently where they can let Wikipedians know in certain health topic areas that you know this review has come out and this is one you want to make sure you get in all your articles on this topic you know if it's brain cancer or whatever right so you know we're trying to set up things past you know me being there you know that will set permanent things into place whether it's mailing lists or people being able to sign up for alerts you know we're, we're working on linking what they already have in place with with our systems to try to you know permanently do this type of thing so we are thinking long term on, on things like that as well and I think that's a similar challenge for us yeah. because the, the, what we had beforehand was a situation where there's a lot of goodwill towards editing Wikipedia and no time at all to do it now we have John here for six months we've got some a chance to really get some stuff done but there's there's as always with things there's a, these things there's the risk that when six months is up it just goes back to how it was before yeah. so we're, we're really trying to put in I, I think now, in now we're a few years we into Wikipedia in residence we recognize that the early ones tended to be uh, you know great while they lasted but there wasn't the follow through. Uh, and uh, it's actually the same at the Royal Society and Cancer Research UK. They'd actually, they'd, they were doing stuff before the Wikipedia in Residence came. And the, uh, you know, the managers in, internally are very intent on continuing to do stuff at a lower level mm. after the actual Wikipedia in Residence has left. And I, th I think that's, uh, that will be great. I, I see a lot of it, you know, is helping identify how to change the culture so that, like, it, for Cochrane, for example, when they are planning their, their research, the review trials, you know, for them to actually begin thinking about how they're going to disseminate their research, and part of that will be disseminating on Wikipedia. So when you build a process from the beginning and have it part of those people's job workflow, then it will eventually become part of the culture, and you won't need a Wikipedia in a residence there. It'll, it'll be the way it works. Now, that doesn't happen in two weeks or no, six months. Absolutely. You know, it, it takes time, but I believe that's the seeds that I'm planting inside I mean, that organization. In terms of the nuts and bolts of it for us, yeah. what it might look like is so the, the, the clinical yeah. pages on our website get reviewed every two years by ex external reviewers. Can we somehow plug those reviews back out into the Wikipedia community so that the, 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 the latest references that we're identifying get aired out into the community? Yeah. There was another question. Yeah, we've only got a couple of minutes left. We're, we're quick with the okay, questions. Yeah. Is this working? Oh, possibly not. Thanks. Um, just wanted to ask a question about Wikipedia versus uh, Cancer Research UK in terms of good, good and bad, I think, that Wikipedia has to offer at the moment. And, I'm, and I think that Wikipedia has a lot of strengths, actually, that it could be an ideal solution for a patient. But um, just in February this year, somebody close to me um, had a, a disease diagnosis, and so you go to Google and you get helpful, helpful um, articles from Cancer Research UK and from Wikipedia. So you click Cancer Research UK and you get a nice sort of helpful set of advice designed for a patient. And if you go to prognosis, it, it basically says, do you want to look at this information? Bear in mind this is complex, your disease is individual. If you go to Wikipedia at that time, although the article's better than it was, and maybe you fixed that, if you, it said, you clicked on it, and the first line was, this disease has a poor prognosis with an average life expectancy of four months. Wow, you know, yeah. and for a new patient. And I mean, that's also, you know, a very complex disease that has many different subtypes, so you can't say that about any one person. We had, we had a very interesting discussion at yeah, our, at so our so offices so on, on, um, Thursday. on Thursday. We had a bunch of the medical editors come down, and one of the issues we raised is how do you talk about prognosis on Wikipedia? And, and also, I mean, the thing is, these things are always, the stats are always out of date. They're constantly changing. Mm. Um, now, happily, you know, actually that wasn't the case. So, um, it, but, but the wow factor of shock for a new patient, there should be some sort of care when, when people are editing Wikipedia about how disease is being presented. I, th I think these are the kind of things that we, we're starting right. to, to, to get, a, get a handle on because the, the me medical manual style doesn't really have much about how to write about prognosis in it. It just says put the section under put, put this information under a section marked prognosis. Mm -hmm. It doesn't talk about how to contextualise it. So we well, had a very interesting discussion. I think the whole, um, he mentioned lead, you know, w Wikipedia in the medical area 
is getting more and more aggressive about the way we're managing our leads. And we're, we're, we haven't transitioned nearly all the articles yet, but we understand that that is key and it's a large part of what you're talking about. Because if you can get a good lead that actually presents things better, then a lot of people, that's what they're gonna read. You know, and by the time they read further down in the article, then it's gonna be, they're gonna want to know that already, mm -hmm. if they're gonna keep reading, you know. So it's like, so I feel like taking an aggressive stance on dealing with the lead will, will in many ways help a great deal. But I, I do agree there's a specific uh, problem that, well that doesn't quite, you know, yeah. just, that doesn't quite cover what we were saying. Uh, but there's a specific issue with prognosis and I don't, I don't think we've kind of really, uh, the trouble is there are very few regular medical editors and there are what 25,000 articles or something. There's less editing than, the, than there used to be uh, and we desperately need more uh, editors, particularly those with uh, a good understanding of medical issues. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have a consistent approach uh, uh, towards particularly prognosis, particularly prognosis by stage, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And I think we should, and I think I, I, I kind of agree with you very much that we should be more conservative. Um, I mean, one idea I floated on Thursday was that we should just there should be a certain cutoff figure below which we just don't give figures. There, there are issues with that, but, but that's, um, so we're talking a bit about, bit, we're, uh, you know, we're kind of talking about how does Wikipedia compare with uh, NHS choices, in the case of cancer, NCI, you know, with the other people on the first page of Google for medical information. That's the session which Henry and I and uh, Doc James, who's one of the leading medical editors, uh, and Henry Potts, who's an academic. So we're doing that at 5.30 in 456. And this may actually be a technical solution, so maybe the answer, because we may need other space on Wikipedia. Reference space is one thing we like. We're open uh, sources. You could ha actually have references written out, abstracts. And also perhaps better places you could go for decision-making charts and things like that that aren't really appropriate for a true Wikipedia article, but yet would be very appropriate to be on Wikipedia in a different type of namespace. So those are technical solutions, perhaps, eventually, you know, to yeah. this. Yeah. Sadly, I think we're out of time there. Um, so thanks to the panel, and thanks for all the questions from you guys, too. Thanks, Thanks, John, guys. for uh, posing the session. Get away from seeing that. No, no, it was. Uh, it was, it was uh,